Bless the Lord. We're going to go back today. We're reading once again. We're in the book of Matthew. We're in chapter 18. And we're just going to think once again, for the last time, uh, about those same verses that we've been looking at over this last week or two. So it's Matthew chapter 18, and it's verse 11. Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine, and goes into the mountains, and seeks that which has gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Just the same verses, and as always, we look to the Lord. We trust that his blessing will rest upon his word. We have been, as we've said, we have been thinking about outreach. We have been trying to build what we've been doing from the beginning of the year. And of course, whenever we think of the verses of Scripture that we have been on this last week or two, we, we can't let them go by without also tying in that verse in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, where Jesus said, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, you may remember over this last couple of weeks, we looked at the importance of one to God. We also looked at the importance of one to the devil. And I want to continue on that um, there was one or two things that more that I wanted to say last week, and obviously for time's sake, I had to put them off to the day. But today, really, what we want to think of is the influence of one. The influence of one. And I want to say this morning, the church can meet as often as it likes, and the church can enjoy the presence of the Lord as much as it likes, and the church can sing, and the church can worship God as much as it likes, but if you and if I, if we are not witnessing for the Master, we are not fulfilling the purpose of the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you agree with that today? The very last thing that Jesus said to those disciples before he was taken into glory, he says was, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he said, wait for the promise of the Father. You will be endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And you will be witnesses unto me. Your purpose and mine is to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. But I wonder sometimes, do we really take the Great Commission seriously? I wonder, do we? I want to tell you how important it is for those who claim to know the Lord to get our priorities right and to get our vision right according to God's holy word and according to God's holy laws. How many sins, we touched on this last Sunday, how many sins did James say would be hidden whenever a wanderer is restored? Was it a few? No, that verse at the end of James' epistle, chapter 5, verse 20, said it was a multitude of sins that would be covered. And the lesson for you and for me, surely, is to go after the one from the very time that that person somehow gets trapped and that person somehow seems to go astray. You see, the time to go after the backslider, the time to go after the person who doesn't know the Lord, folks, listen to me, is not to plan something for 2020 or not to plan something for 2019. The time to go after that person is now because this is the only time that you and I are sure of. This is the only time. And yet we plan and we wonder, should we do this, should we try that? And we put it off and we put it off and we put it off. And maybe you're living beside somebody and you've never spoken to them about Jesus. The Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. We were just looking at that in the Bible study last Monday night, developing the roots of Christian character. I'll, I'll have that up on SoundCloud, God willing, tomorrow. Maybe some of us need to take a wee listen to that. And we didn't go into it in great detail. 
But we did discuss fear and what the Bible says about fear and how the Bible says to fear not and how fear centers yourself completely on yourself. Because fear makes you look inwardly. I can't do this. I won't manage that. What if that happens? And you look at yourself and it takes your eyes off God and makes you focus completely upon your own ability. Jesus never asked you and me to do anything in our own ability. But he promised the Holy Spirit who would enable us to do what he wants us to do. And I wonder how many of us really have set ourselves ever to go after someone, to go after someone who needs the Lord. This is what Oswald Saunders tells us in one of his books about a man who was a noted infidel. Forgive me, I'm going to read this just off to you. I copied this straight out of the book. This is what Oswald Saunders tells us. This is what the infidel said. He said, if I were a religionist, and did I firmly, fully, consistently believe, as millions say they do, that the knowledge and the practice of religion in this life influences the destiny of the other, Religion, said he, would be everything to me. I would cast aside earthly enjoyments as dross, earthly cares as folly, earthly thoughts and feelings as less than vanity. Religion, of course, he didn't know any better than to talk about or to call it religion. He says, religion would be my first waking thought and my last image whenever sleep pulls me into unconsciousness. I would labor in her cause alone. I would not labor for the meat that perishes, nor for the treasures on earth, but only for a crown of glory in heavenly regions where treasures and happiness are a life beyond the reach of time and chance. I would take thought for the morrow of eternity alone. I would esteem one soul gained to heaven worth a life of suffering. There would be neither worldly Buddhas nor calculating circumspection in my engrossing deal. Earthly consequences should never stay my hand nor seal my lips. I would speak to the imagination, awaken the feelings, stir up the passions, arouse the fancy. Earth and joys and its grips should occupy no moment of my thoughts, for these are but the affairs of a portion of eternity, so small that no language can express it comparatively, express its comparatively infinite littleness. But we live for this life. And it's so insignificant compared to the vastness of eternity. He said, I would strive to look on eternity and on immortal souls around me, soon to be everlastingly miserable or everlastingly happy. I would deem all who thought only of this world merely seeking to increase temporal happiness and laboring to obtain temporal goods. I would deem all pure madness. And I would go forth to the world and preach to it in season and out of season, and by text would be, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And folks, those are the words of an infidel. I wonder how many of us would express sentiments like that, and we're called the people of God. You see, there's an influence that has got to be exerted by you and by me as individuals. And unless you and I are expressing that influence individually, the church has no hope of expressing that influence. Because the church, dear ones, is you. And the church is me. Amen. And the church, the life in the church, depends completely upon the life in the individual. How well that life's walking with Christ. How well that life's seeking to obey the Lord. How well that Christ's seeking to live for him. Didn't the gifts of the Spirit exhort us this morning to rise and praise the King who died for you and me? How many of us did that? And that was the Holy Spirit. Folks, have we become people who can't obey the voice of Almighty God? Have we? I wonder how many of us have taken up the Great Commission. And I'm not talking about overseas missions. Praise God for that. I'd be quite honest with you. That was never my thing. And I knew it wasn't. I pray for missions. 
I tried to give to missions. I tried to support missions. But it was never my thing. But I always knew there was a mission field right around the area where I lived or wherever I was involved at in life. Go into all the world, Jesus said, and preach the gospel. And surely it's time that the church of Jesus Christ was awakened to serve. And it's time that the church was ablaze and aflame for Christ in the days in which we live. We have a nation around us that is perishing. And few of us seem to care. I was reading through a sermon this week. Do you know what that dear brother entitled it? Who cares if a soul goes to hell? And so many of us as Christians, that's exactly how we live our lives. Because we are never involved, really, in earnestly trying to seek a soul that needs Christ. What a difference from the Lord Jesus Christ. He leaves the 90 and 9. He goes after the one. Beloved, may we be people who catch the vision of one. You and I may never do great things, but if you and I see one person saved, praise God. Amen. Praise God for that. Praise God. And the commission is there to go and to share and to preach the gospel. What about the one that you could reach? What about that one? The one that you could reach if only you really tried. What about that one? Because that one is so important. So important to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus crosses the Sea of Galilee and you'll know that story. He has to calm a storm on the way across that sea. You know the story. And he stands up. You know, Lord, do you not care that we perish? Peace be still. And he calms the storm. Do you know why he had to calm the storm? You know this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. He had to calm the storm because Jesus was on his way to the place where there was one who was important to the devil. You know the story, the man of Gadara. And he had so many demons in him, but whenever Jesus asked the name, my name is Legion because we are many. That could range from 2,000 to 6,000. You think that can't happen? Believe you me, it can. My name is Legion for we are many. And you see, that one was important. So important to the devil. The devil had kept people in fear through that man. The devil had been able to display his power through that man. They couldn't bind him. They couldn't tie him. He lived amongst the tombs. The devil had a stronghold because he had managed to captivate that life and work through that man. Oh, he was important to the devil. And Jesus makes his way across the Sea of Galilee and the devil tries to oppose him. Now folks, understand me. There's no battle between God and the devil. You know, we talk about a battle that's going on, but Jesus is a mighty king. Amen. He's the all-victorious risen Lord. That's who he is. But nonetheless, the devil tries to oppose the moving of the Lord to touch that life that was so important to the devil himself. But praise God, Jesus lands upon the shore and that man, that one who was important to Jesus, Jesus set him gloriously and wonderfully free. And you know the story. The people ask for Jesus to leave their community. Our brother David Legg was talking about this just a few weeks ago whenever we were listening to him. They asked Jesus to leave, and the man said he was, it says of the man that he was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they asked Jesus to leave, and the man says to Jesus, let me come with you. I'm paraphrasing. This is the DM version. Let me come with you. And Jesus says to him, no. And the man said, let me come with you. 
And Jesus said, no. And the man said, let me come with you. And Jesus said no. And the reason I'm repeating that is because if you read it in the Amplified Version, the, the verb there, the Amplified Version, translates, it says it like this. The man kept on begging and begging and begging that Jesus would let them go with him. And can you imagine what it would have been like if that dear one had have went with Jesus? Can you imagine the, the miracles that he would have seen Jesus do? Can you imagine the people that he would have seen touched by the Lord? But Jesus says, no, no. No, no, he says, you're not going with me. But Jesus said, no, go back to your family. Go back to your home. And show them what great things the Lord has done for you. And it tells us there in Luke's gospel, chapter 8, it says, and he went his way and he published throughout the city how great things Jesus had done for him. And you read on across the scriptures. And further on you find that whenever Jesus came back to that same area, they flocked to hear him. They come out in their droves to see Jesus. And the Bible says that they brought their sick. And the Bible says that he healed them. And they said many believed on him in that area. Why? Friends, because the one that he had delivered and left to testify, had done exactly as his Lord Jesus Christ had asked him to do. And he had told them about Christ. And he had shown them a life that was changed. And he bore witness to the power of Christ. And he testified to what Christ had done for him. And whenever the presence of Jesus visited that area once again, many, many people were mightily touched by him. Is that what he wants the church to do? Is that how we should be living? You see, that's the importance, the significance, the influence of one. Of one. And Jesus went across the sea to pick up that one that was important to the devil. We can pick another story. You go to John's Gospel, chapter 4, and you come there to the story of the woman at the well. And listen, the disciples are so caught up with their own lives. We'll go and get some food. Huh? That amazes me. And Jesus sits down at the well. But they go to get food. All they're interested in is their own stomach, their own well-being, their own needs. And Jesus waits at the well. And the woman comes out At midday, the heat of the blazing sun, a time whenever nobody comes to the well because it's too warm to carry water at that hour of the day. And no doubt this woman comes to the well at that time of the day because she has been ostracized by all women. There's all sorts of stuff happening there. I don't know what that is. You see, the time to draw water would have been earlier in the morning in the cooler part. And there she is on her own, midday sun blazing upon her, and she comes to the well, and she meets with Jesus. And she had had five husbands. You know the story as well as I do. And she is now living in complete adultery. And Jesus said to her, go and get rid of him that you're living with, and I'll accept you. Is that what he said? Of course not. Of course that's not what he said. Jesus said, if you had asked me, I would give you living water. Jesus says, I have got something for your soul that you are in complete need of. And he says, I'm willing to give that to you if you would just ask for it. And you see, he didn't throw a rule book at her. We're good at that, aren't we? And we get set in our ways in church and we become legalistic. And this has to be like this and that has to be like that. Do this, don't do that. We're not living by grace at all. We're living by law. Whenever a new child is born and you bring that little baby out, out of the hospital and you bring it home, what's the first thing you do? Do you toss it in the rule book for the house and say that's the things you can do and that's the things you can't do while you're living in this house? Do we do that? 
course not. No, friends, we offer it love. We offer it, is it TC, they call it nowadays? Tender care. We give it food to eat. We seek to nourish it. We seek to nurture it along. And so often, we're so quick at judging people that we want to slap their wrists with the rule book because somehow they've done something wrong. And I said to you last week, behind every individual life that goes astray, behind every life that's caught in sin, there's spiritual work behind that. Workers of iniquity, spiritual darkness, the rulers in high places. And we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We need to get the vision right. We're wrestling against those spiritual entities that oppose the souls of men and women. And it's time as the church of Jesus Christ we got real with that. And we did business with that. And we tackled that in the authority of his name and began to see people set free. Ah, that was a poor answer there. But folks, that's truth. And so Jesus looks at this woman. She lives, she's living in adultery. I wonder how many people you know who's living in adultery. And he looks at her. And he doesn't accuse her. And he doesn't condemn her. She's a victim of her sin. And he says to her, I can give you living water. I can put something into your soul and you will never thirst again. You will be set up for time and you will be set up for all of eternity. And she leaves her water pot and she goes away. And whenever she's away, the disciples, they have just returned. They wonder why Jesus is even talking to a woman like that. And you know what that story tells me? He bypassed his own and he picked up a woman at the street. Because she goes back into the town. Come see a man. John 4 and 29. Come see a man that told me all things that I did. Is not this the Christ? And she tells him about it. And he lifted this woman off the street, so to speak. And he bypassed his own, his very own disciples. And she turned into a great evangelist. Because the people came out to see Jesus. So much so. That Jesus said, lift up your eyes. Look onto the fields, for they are white unto harvest. And they flocked out to see this one. Verse 39, it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. Listen to this. For the saying of the woman who testified, He told me all that ever I did. The importance of one, beloved. The influence of one. What one can do in the kingdom of Almighty God. And the reason I'm telling you this today is because maybe that one that you need to look for, maybe that one that you should be chasing down, maybe that one who's living next door to you that you've never taken the time to speak to, maybe that's the very one who's going to see countless scores of others brought to Christ, just like the woman at the well and just like the man with the legion of demons. Because you don't know what the potential of that life can be. You don't know what Christ might want to do through that life. And yet we let them pass by. And we don't testify for Jesus. And so many people go on their merry way without knowing anything about what Christ can do in a life whenever he comes to touch it and change it. The importance of one. Who knows what evangelist might come forth out of your witness for the master? And you see, that's what this is all about. Let me back that up when I'm finished. Because in John's Gospel, chapter 17, and you know that's another very favorite chapter of mine, where we eavesdrop and we listen to Jesus praying to his heavenly Father. And in the beginning of that chapter, he talks about eternal life. This is life eternal, that they might know you, the true and living God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And he lays out before us the definition of eternal life. 
See, the definition of eternal life is knowing him, relationship with him. If you're in this service this morning and you don't have that relationship with him, you're missing out on eternal life. Because through Jesus Christ, you can know God in a real and in a living way. And further down that chapter, as Jesus prays in verse 18, Jesus says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also sent them into the world. And in verse 20, he says, neither pray I for them alone. Listen to this. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And then you and I can't talk about Jesus. You and I don't witness and testify for the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of the time Jesus is praying for those who will believe on him through your word and through mine. Bit of a waste of time for Christ, isn't it? I say that reverently. If you and I are not going to take up the commission and tell people about him the way he has asked us to do. He says, and I pray not for them alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Beloved, how we need to be witnessing for the Lord. How we need to be fulfilling his command. When we look out around a nation today and we think about the country all around us where laws are being changed and people are into all kinds of things. And can I tell you, by and large, the church of Jesus Christ lives completely with blinkers on because you have no idea what's going on in some of the lives of people out there. And yet we don't search them out and we don't chase them down in order that Christ might give them the living water of life that would make them, praise God, never thirst after the things of the world again. We need to be busy for the Lord Jesus Christ, reaching, touching, yes, look, one at a time. One at a time. I said to you the first week we thought on this, you, the night you were saved, Jesus saved you, dear one, as an individual. Whether you were in the company of all our people who got saved or whether you weren't, nevertheless, he did business with you, an individual, because you're important to him. And he saved you because you're important to him. And he needs you because you're important to him. And he's asking you to serve him because you're important to him. Because who knows who he might want you to touch. That that person might be empowered by him to touch so many others. You see, today I think of people in the history of the church who have come and gone. You know, I think of the, the D.L. Moody's. I think of the Billy Graham's. I think that of the different people down through the ages, Sankey, all of those people. And God used them mightily. And what I think is the person who led them to the Lord, I wonder did that person ever know that Billy Graham was going to become what he would be? I wonder, did that person know that John Wesley would be what he was going to be? Or Charles Wesley, or Sankey, or Moody, or Whitfield, or any of the rest of them, or Smith Wigglesworth. But somewhere along the line, someone touched that one. And through that one, God did great things. And he's calling you and he's calling me today to make sure that somewhere in that mix we're playing our part. That in the body of Christ we're doing what he wants us to do. And that we're being the witness that he wants us to be. And there's so many ways to do that. But he's calling us to be active and to be witness, witnesses and to be bold witnesses for him in these days of time. My time is gone. The importance of one. The importance of one to God. The importance of one to the devil. The influence that one can make whenever one searches them out 
and brings them savingly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you want to be a part of that? Don't you? I know I do. I do. Let's give ourselves to evangelism and to witness and to testimony. And may God help us to do that. Father, we thank you today for the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for the potential that's in every single life. Lord, the potential in this room today, Lord, only you know what that might be. And Lord, it's much, much greater by far than any of us could care to imagine or think. Lord, we pray for ourselves today. Help us, Lord. Anoint us, Lord, to do and to be what you want us to do and what you want us to be. Give us the power, give us the anointing that we need, Lord, to be witnesses, to testify a good testimony to the glory of your holy name and to be involved as much as we possibly can, Lord, to see other precious souls one by one brought savingly to you. And Lord, we pray today for the outreach from this assembly. Every area, Lord. We think of skate today amongst the younger children. We think of our Sunday school in behind today. And we work our way right up through that, Lord, through the Bible class, through our young people this evening. We think of our sisterhood on Wednesday evening. We think of the men's fellowship. Lord, we think of our senior citizens. Lord, we think of Oasis there on a Saturday morning. Help us, O oh God, we pray, to touch lives. That these lives might be touched by you. Lord, help us to touch them in your name and for your glory. And grant loving God that we will see them saved. And Lord, we pray for the potential that you have placed in those lives that are yet to be won. We pray that you will release that potential to its fullness. And we ask, Lord, that they in turn will go on to touch others. And they in turn will go on to touch others. And they in turn will go on to touch others. And somewhere in the midst of all of that that you are doing, Lord, we will have played our part. Anoint us, O God, we pray. Bless your word to our hearts. May we receive this challenge in the grace that is given. And Lord, may our hearts be provoked to respond to you in such a way that at least with this message or these couple or three messages, we wouldn't just be hearers of the word. But Lord, that we would be doers. For your name's sake and for your glory, we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God.